present Walt Disney's Disneyland. When you wish upon a star Makes no difference who you are Each week as you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Fantasyland, the happiest kingdom of them all. Tomorrowland, promise of things to come. Adventureland, the wonder world of nature's own realm. Frontierland, tall tales and true from the legendary past. Presenting this week from Frontierland, along the Oregon Trail. And now your host, Walt Disney. The starting point of the Oregon Trail was here in the vicinity of my hometown, Kansas City. And even in my boyhood days, there were old timers still living who had been west over the trail. One of my grandfathers, in fact, hitchhiked all the way to California and back. He literally lost his shirt when his mule was swept away in fording a stream. But though he didn't find gold, he found adventure and arrived home with many a good story to tell. I remember as a kid a saying those old pioneers had. When they wanted to give the impression that they'd seen some pretty fabulous sights, they'd say they had seen the elephant. Well, through their wonderful tales, I saw the elephant too. And I came to realize that there are great stories in that frontier setting. Now, we found the opportunity to tell one of them in our feature production, Westward Ho! The Wagon. Later in the program, we'll see some scenes from the picture. There'll be lots of excitement too, because it reenacts many true incidents of the old trail. But right now, we have another story for you. Reading up on the Oregon Trail, we came across hundreds of old diaries like this. And these accounts give a very clear picture of what the trip west was actually like. The journey itself took about six months, but it would take six times that long to retell all the experiences recorded in these books. We realized this when we got our feature production into work, and we decided we couldn't cram all of this research into one motion picture continuity. And yet the information in these forgotten journals seemed so interesting that we decided to bring you from Frontierland, the background story of the Oregon Trail. You might call it living history, a story about some plain everyday people who took it upon themselves to blaze a trail across the wilderness. In fact, when we first read these eyewitness accounts, the thing that struck us was that people of all sorts went west not just adventurers and gold hunters, but whole families, children, farmers, professional men. In our film, for instance, the leading character is a frontier doctor, for medical men were part of this historic pageant too. And tonight, I've asked Fess Parker, who plays the doctor, to help us relive the experience of going west. I believe we'll find him on the Westward Ho set. Hi there, folks. Our story tonight is the story of the Oregon Trail in terms of its people. The mountain man, the fur trader, the pioneer, the Indian, and the frontier doctor. Oddly enough, the white man and the Indian each had his own kind of medicine man, and both had their place on the frontier. It's a fact that the trip to Oregon meant six months on the trail. And during that time, life went on as usual. People took sick, babies were born, an epidemic of cholera might strike. All in all, it was good to have a doctor along. When I came to play the part, I wondered what equipment a medical man of that period might carry. And so we went into the subject a bit and fitted out a typical doctor's kit. In frontier times, uh, a doctor's bag served as the nearest drugstore. And besides bandages and a primitive stethoscope, it was apt to contain calomel, powdered uh, ipecac, something called dragon's blood, 
Cincona, also known as Peruvian bark. Powdered sassafras, liquid root. And that old standby, castor oil, old reliable. Now tonight, I'm gonna pose you the same question. What would you need if a hundred years ago you were making the trip to Oregon? Let's pretend you've decided to join our wagon train. What would you start with? Well, more than likely, you'd try to get your hands on a good guidebook, one like this. The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California and all necessary information relative to the equipment, supplies, and the method of traveling. Published 1844. As you can see, there were do-it-yourself books even a century back. And here's the kind of information that made them useful. Near the Platte River. Go three and a half miles and you will see willows south of the road. These are the last species of timber of any kind on the north side of the river for a distance of 200 miles except one cedar tree. Buffalo chips will be found in abundance and when dry, they answer a good purpose for fuel. Upper Ferry. When the wind blows, which it usually does here, the dust is intolerable. Greasewood Creek, no feed. Between here and the Sweetwater River, there is much alkali water standing in pools, and it is sure death for cattle to drink it. But before you took on these hazards, you'd study the map a bit just to find out where the Oregon Trail went. And though you might not appreciate the fact at first, later on when you were well out on the trail, you'd come to realize that it was the rivers that made the trip possible. Here's what I mean. The jump off place was on a river, the Missouri, here at what we now call Kansas City. In the old days, the trail left Westport Landing and went west and north toward the Platte River. Once the trail joined the Platte, it ran almost due west for 600 miles through what is now Nebraska and Wyoming. Then the Sweetwater River branched off to within striking distance of the Continental Divide. Over the hump at South Pass and onto the headwaters of the Green River, and then across to the Upper Snake in what is now Idaho. And finally over the Blue Mountains to the mighty Columbia and Oregon. And that was the way of it. The rivers were like trapezes for the long swing west. Where one left off, another always seemed to begin in exactly the right place. And all in all, looking at the map and the river trapezes, you might come to the conclusion that it wouldn't be too tough a trip. But even though you owned a guidebook, you'd still be smart to hire somebody who knew the country. It was 2,000 miles to Oregon, and an awful lot could go wrong, especially if you were new at trailing, and most families didn't know beans about it. Typical of the professional scout of frontier days is the character Hank Breckenridge in Westward Ho the Wagons. The part is just made for my friend Jeff York. Jeff, come over here by the fire and meet the folks. Got some people who'd like to go west with us. Good time to be going. Grass is getting greener every day. Well, Jeff, the frontier scout seems to be a mighty important man in Western history. Well, I don't know how important he was, but he was all man, that's guaranteed. Well, it took a fellow with gumption, all right. Tell these folks about his other qualifications. He was generally a mountain man to begin with. A fellow with an itchy foot and a mistrust of civilization. Sort of like a lone wolf? Yeah, you might call him that. Men like Jim Bridger and John Coulter and old Jed Smith, they liked a lot of elbow room. And before long, they knew that big country out there like it was their own private pea patch. As Hank Breckenridge, Jeff here is typical of all those old scouts, and it's his job to know the lay of the land and the whereabouts of good grass and good water. Well, that was supposed to be a scout's main duty, 
But I suspect, like in our picture, that, that keeping people out of trouble was really his main worry. In fact, problems cropped up even before the journey began. And tonight, we'd like to reenact some of them. Now, uh, suppose you were packing to go along. You'd find there was quite a technique to it. And often, the experienced head knew a trick or two that was worth using. But let me show you what I mean. Say I'm in character now as Hank Breckenridge. And say I'm making the rounds on the last minute tour of inspection before we start. Pulling up stakes was a matter of taking what you needed and letting the rest go hang. But with a lot of the women, it took an act of Congress to get them to make up their minds. And the young brides was often the most impractical. For some reason, they had a notion Oregon was only a hoop and a holler over the hill. And as sure as shooting, they'd load up with every knick-knack they ever owned. <clears throat> Excuse me, Miss Martha, but maybe if I could make a suggestion, better forget about that there chinaware. But this is my nicest wedding present. I know, I know, but you've got to remember, you're going to be in for an awful lot of hard bouncing and johnson between here and Oregon. Well, I don't care. This tea set was a wedding present from my mother and father, and I intend to carry it all the way to Oregon, on my lap if necessary. Well, I see that you got your mind made up. Yes, I have. And I'm afraid there's no use in you arguing, because you can't make me change it. But, ma'am, there's two things I never argue with. Women and grizzly bears. <laughs> well, if you got your heart set on, maybe I can show you a trick or two. Where do you keep your barrel of flour? Over there, under that bedding. As the feller says, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Got a big spoon or a dipper handy? Ah, that's fine. Now we need a bowl. Here, that one'll do. Make a big hole in this stuff. Sort of a uh, teapot nest, you might call it. There you are, ma'am. You care to store your valuables away in my shockproof container? <laughs> Another one. There you are. Safe as a clutch of duck eggs and a nest of down. Oh, thank you, Hank. I never in the world would have thought of this. Guess I'm not really so smart after all. Well, it ain't a question of smartness. Guess I'm as dumb as they come by a lot of things. Fact is, most of what I know is what not to do. <laughs> Here, just keep on doing what I've been doing. Uh-oh. Miss Martha. Never leave your matches kicking around loose like this. Matches is mighty important out in the trail. You'd be surprised how easy it is to get wet. But there's a trick for this, too. Got an empty bottle around? I guess uh, in a pinch, could start a fire by rubbing two sticks together. <laughs> Most folks, though, they uh, like to do it the easy way, by striking a match. There you are. Bottle corked at all times keeps it waterproof. So I see. But once again, Hank, I must say thank you. Well, you'll be thanking me mostly you're out there in the trail, sitting there in the middle of a cloudburst, everything's soaking wet, and you trying to get a campfire started. <laughs> That's when you're going to prize that bottle. As the engine say, heap big medicine. Now, it wasn't just the female contingent that caused trouble. Some of the male members wasn't no bargain when it came to looking ahead, either. Hey, Foster. What you doing with that there grindstone? That's going to tie it on the wagon there. Got to have something to keep my nose to when I get to Oregon. <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm sorry, Foster, but for your own good, you better leave it behind. Well, how am I going to keep my tools home sharp? Well, just use a little old elbow grease. You know what that thing weighs? No, can't say to do. Well, if you don't know now, you're sure fire going to know about the second week out there in the trail when your wagon's busted and your horses are down with sore backs. Well, you, you take this grindstone here and, and that anvil over there and put them together. Why, man, the first river you come across, you're going to sink down plumb out of sight, and you ain't never going to come up again. 
Well, took all kinds. Sod busters, top hats, people like Judge Dixon. There was many like him. Could read law and spout poetry by the hour. Yet when it come to real judgment, had about as much straight-grained horse sense as a bright mud turtle. Well, Hank, now that I got my law books packed, I'm ready any time for the great exodus. Where in tarnation's your food? Right here. Food for the mind, my boy. Food for the mind. Well, you better begin thinking about your belly as well as your brain. Books is dead weight, Judge. Every extra pound here will weigh ten more out on the trail. My advice is get rid of them. Man cannot live by bread alone, my boy. These are my nourishment. I'm a judge, you know, a representative of the law. These books are the very cornerstone of the new society that we propose to establish. If I leave them behind, as you suggest, how can fair justice, that goddess of liberty, play her proper part in the new land? Justice be hanged. Precisely. That's just my point. We'll all be hanged here, without her unless... Here, here, Is justice enough, Judge? But I'm a practicing lawyer. Not a preacher. Well, it's about time you started practicing what I preach. Well, now, Hank, I'm afraid I haven't made my position clear. Your position's clear enough, Judge. Until we get to Oregon, I'm both judge and jury. I'm allowing you one book. Listen, it's for this here new society you aim to set up. Take a look at them Ten Commandments. You'll find all the law you need. Well, it's a wonder some of them ever got there. But being green never seemed to keep them from starting. Roll your wagon! Once underway, things kind of got shook down, and people fell into their niche, and the journey began to make sense. And it's a fact that most people brought along two things that were saving graces, their sense of humor and their courage. And here's the true pioneering spirit of the trail as we expressed it in our motion picture. Westward roll the wagons, westward roll them far. Westward roll the wagons for the western star. America's in motion and her hopes are turning west. Let's all get a going for a new land's always best. Westward roll the wagons, always westward roll. That's the way the journey began, with a song and a general feeling of picnic on the trail. And in the beginning, the whole experience was sort of fun, like camping out. Everybody's spirits were high, there was adventure in the air. The tough going was yet to come. Jeff, how about conjuring up for these folks a picture of what the old time prairie looked like? Well, it was a place where distance never seemed to end. Lots of room to get lost in, unless you knew the landmarks. And of course, that was the scout's specialty. Beyond the Missouri River, the trees began to thin out. The forest border had been reached, and ahead lay the open, wind-swept plain. From here on, the sighting of a single tree would become an event, a highlight of the day's travel. And these solitary sentinels became trail markers too valuable to cut down for wood. When Courthouse Rock came in sight, it meant real progress was being made. For here was the beginning of the High Plains. The pioneers named the larger of these buttes Courthouse Rock, and the smaller one Jail Rock because they resembled these same public buildings back in their hometowns. And even today, the similarity is striking. Another unmistakable guidepost was the slender spire of Chimney Rock. The grassy plain supported a natural kind of cattle in the buffalo, and many a meal was made a banquet by the addition of fresh meat. Out in the prairie, the pioneers learned to live off the land, like the Indian. The cook pot was filled as you went along, and nature never failed to provide. But as the old mountain men had learned long since, you had to take what nature served up. Sometimes she put some mighty strange things in the menu. And now, 
going to show you some of the actual foods of the frontier. When's supper, Mr. Hank? I'm starved. Oh, hi there, Dixie. Oh, uh, just about any time now. Mmm, that smells good. Is it something special? Sure is. Something real special. You go tell the women folks supper's about ready, huh? And honey, uh, take this pot over where you go, huh? You long enough, Mr. Breckenridge? Land sakes, I could have cooked three meals in that pot. <laughs> oh, shucks, ladies. I just wanted to sharpen up your appetites. Now, everybody, pull your chairs in. Let's pitch in. <laughs> Pitching, indeed. Did you ever? Such an uncouth man. My, what an interesting variety, Mr. Breckenridge. You said you had a surprise for us, didn't you? He said it'd taste even better than fried chicken back home in Virginia. Well, now. Ladies, I hope I didn't promise you too much. All I said was that I'd feed you exactly what I had, me and the engines. How about uh, starting with some of this, huh? Looks good. What is it? <laughs> Names don't mean much, Miss Parkinson. It's a taste what counts. Yep. Go ahead, try it. Miss Parkinson? Well, I'm glad you're favorite, ma'am. You know, that's a that's an engine dish. It's called pemmican. It's made out of dried meat and marrow grease. Of course, I always throw in a little handful of fermented berries. It gives that extra tang. Here, boys, try some of these. Mmm, these are good. Yeah, tastes just like acorns. What are they? Roasted grasshoppers? Roasted what? Roasted grasshoppers. Look at that uh, berry fire a couple of days ago. Uh, Miss Forster, would you pass your plate down, ma'am, please? What's your pleasure? White meat or dark meat? It all looks good, but uh, maybe the light meat. Ma'am. Here you are, ma'am. And you, Miss Butler? Uh, I'll take the other. Yes, ma'am. Here you are, ma'am. Thank you. Has a strange flavor, Mr. Breckenridge. Tastes a little like pork. Could it be pork? Oh no, ma'am. That's barbecued beaver tail. Oh. Couldn't find a more nourishing meat, ma'am. You know that uh, buffalo chip fire makes it real flavorsome too. And this? Oh, well, that's my specialty, ma'am. Your, your specialty? Yes, ma'am. Tastiest dish there is. Fricassee rattlesnake. Cooked rattlesnake? Ain't it poison? Shucks, no. Why, it's tastier than a crawfish. And twice as toothsome, too. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we got it all to ourselves, boys. Come on, stoke up. You know, I declare. I just don't know what's getting into women folk nowadays. Don't seem to have no, no appetite at all. Just kind of peck around to food like a little old sparrow bird. Well, that was the way it went. He ate what came and maybe laughed about it years later. Like I said, a sense of humor was a good thing to have along. Most everything the pioneers needed on the trail, they had to bring with them. And this included entertainment. There were no movies and no television in those days, and all their amusements had to be of their own making. And so folks turned to their songs and their dances. There was always a fiddle in the squeeze box somewhere in the crowd, 
and an old-fashioned square dance was a standard form of entertainment. Yes, sir. People entertained themselves in those days. And if a person could sing or dance or play a fiddle or a guitar, he was sure to be called upon to perform. Of course, if a fellow could turn his talents to his own use, like, uh, say, uh, Court and his gal, well, that was all right, too. I used to have a sweetheart, but now I got none. Since parting, my darling, I care not for one. The day that I left her, she started to cry. Says if I can't love you, I surely will die. Green grow the lilac, so sparkling with dew. I'm lonely, my darling, since parting with you. And by your next meeting, I hope to prove true and exchange the green lilacs for the red, white, and blue. I passed my love's window both early and late. The look that she gave me, it made my heart ache. The look that she gave me was harmful to see. She loved another one better than me. Green grow the lilacs so sparkling with you. I'm lonely, my darling, since parting with you. But by next meeting, I'll hope to prove true. And, and exchange, change the green lilacs for the red, white, and blue. And change the green lilacs for the red, white, and blue. Just a little song to pay you for my laundry. Why is it doctors are never good at tying ties? Here. Of course, going west wasn't all singing and dancing, not by a long shot. There was danger, too, real danger, always hovering just beyond the firelight. But at the night camps, when the day's traveling was done, when nobody knew or was out there in the dark and nobody could be quite sure what tomorrow would bring, the pioneers took time for meditation. In these quiet moments, they get to feel in the solitude of the prairie, its bigness and and they'd put their trust in somebody bigger than themselves. Hear us, O oh Lord. We need your guiding light. Shine upon the prairie now. Hear us, O oh Lord. Strengthen our faith we must be brave at dawn give us courage to go on hear us O Lord we'll keep our wagons rolling if you are by our side Keep on moving westward with the sun. We'll travel on in glory across the prairie wide. We'll travel on in glory by your side. Hear us, O
when Mr. Disney began the research for his first Western picture, he decided it must include portraits of the Plains Indian and the old time fur trader. One of the most famous trading posts on the old trail was Fort Laramie. And in our picture, the fort is run by a French Canadian named Bissonnette. Hi there, Sebastian. Bonjour, mon ami. Hello, Sebastian. Pull up a stool and sit down. Thank you. Folks, this is Sebastian Cabot who plays the part of Bissonnette. A Cabot playing Bissonnette? Uh, how come an Englishman ends up playing a Frenchman? <laughs> oh, mon ami, in the acting profession, that is not unusual, eh? <laughs> By gare, an actor must be versatile. What you call on le frontier, uh, a jack of all trades, no? <laughs> <laughs> Besides, I not only speak English with a French accent in the picture, but I also have some wonderful sounding speeches in the Sioux dialect. You know, the Sioux language has a natural beauty that's pleasant to the ear, for it seems to echo the voices of nature the rhythm of the wind and the grass, and the sounds of running waters. For example, hin shi hi yi wakan kan, skang pi ang dakota, kata oe hanki, wichang pi ota kusi cha chinkiapi, tawa pazuta sutashni. You know, <laughs> to an actor, it doesn't matter what language he's speaking, just so he has something to say. <laughs> <laughs> No, but seriously, a man like Bissonnette not only learned to speak Indian, but to think Indian too. And consequently, he could be very helpful to the wagon people, as he is in the picture. Uh, it was an honest characterization, and we worked very hard to speak the Indian dialects correctly. <laughs> as you know, Fess, we had a very fine instructor. Well, we're coming to him in a moment. But right now, suppose you tell these folks about Fort Laramie as it was in the early days of the Oregon Trail. In the 1840s, Fort Laramie was not the military establishment it became later. It was simply a trading post and a rather unique institution. You see, it stood at the crossroads of westward travel. And because it was necessary to all comers, it became a sort of uh, truce ground, a kind of uh, king's ex base, where friend and foe could meet on neutral terms. Now, as the manager of the place, Bissonnette was the go-between never taking sides. He ran a sort of a country store where trappers and Indians and pioneers could come and trade for practically anything under the sun. Why, even children came to the old fort. Oh, just a minute. In the early days on the trail, the inexperienced wagon people often had misunderstandings with the Indians because they did not know their ways. And in Westwood Ho the wagons, we find our pioneers getting into trouble on this account. Daughter of rising sun. Take your hands off her. To insult a chief was almost to commit suicide. For the Indian had a fierce personal pride. And sometimes it took a cool head like Bissonnette's to avoid bloodshed. Wolf brother, hold on. Oh, Daka. You could have lost your scalp, monsieur. Never put an hand to an Indian. But he put his hand to her. Only because he thought she was pretty. Because many stars told him she was good médecin. Uh, good luck. I'll go back to your camp now. I try to make this right with the chief. On the frontier, men like Bissonnette rescued many a greenhorn from trouble. But rarely for reasons of personal sympathy. It was just good business. The trader made it a point to remain strictly neutral. And in this self-appointed role of middleman, he often met with strange situations. Here in our picture, for instance, Bissonnette finds himself faced with a real problem in diplomacy. Waste dapi, unkitawa owanka. But you, father, little daughter, rising, son? The little girl has no father, only a brother and sister. Matustula wakan. Good. 
Kodachi Api the Unwahisht. Wa Tokyo Papi a Jana Unwahi. The chief says his gods have told him to make a trade with the white man. Now a trade to a true trader like the Indian was a simple matter of bargaining. It was a case of one party wanting something the other party owned and being willing to exchange it for something of equal value. But barter on these grounds could lead to some interesting problems. In other words, Ms. Ami... In other words, he's offering us a guarantee of safe passage. What does he want for it? Well, these gifts are the, the greatest he can give. They make no gifts. He's looking to trade for something. What's he want? He wants to trade for the little girl. Trade? Yes, the chief claims that the great spirit has spoken to him through many stars, the great medicine man of the Sioux. Tell him no. You not, father. Who speaks for little yellow hair? I speak for my sister. No talk, woman. You not, father. I'm her father and mother. You'll talk to woman. You'll talk to me, you pompous savage. You heard our captain. We won't trade. How about your son? Would you trade him to us? You have God. You must believe in them. Would they let you do this? Kampiota, Vashishchana. Doctor. The role of the medicine man, many stars, is played by Iron Eyes Cody. In our picture, a Sioux. In real life, a member of the Cherokee tribe. How Koda? How Koda? We haven't seen our door when the Kosa here. We come pa, we come, we zoot a wakasa, a tokam na ye. Meaning what? <laughs> Meaning, may your days be many, may your children be strong. May the Great Spirit be with you always. Well, Iron Eyes, I've already shown these folks my doctor's kit. How about showing us the Indian version of the same thing? The Sioux Indian took his medicine from nature and used many herbs and extracts that actually had medical value. But living close to nature as he did, the Indian had great respect for the forces of nature, and he came to associate sacred meaning with certain natural objects, things that were thought to have curing powers. And here, in a scene from our picture, I'm performing the medicine man's ceremony. This dramatization is based on authentic Indian rituals. In our story, the son of Wolf Brother, the Sioux chief, has been thrown from a horse and badly injured. Under the watchful eyes of his father and mother, I'm called upon to cure him. The smoke which I fan towards him comes from sweet grass burning on a bed of coals, using a symbolic eagle wing. I fan the smoke towards the boy to purify him. Then I paint medicine sticks around his bed to ward off evil spirits, and I scatter some of the medicine pigments upon him to bring him renewed strength. If these medicines failed, then, as a last resort, the medicine man would use the buffalo prayer. The Plains Indian believed his strength came from Tatanka, the buffalo, and so it was only natural that this animal should hold a prominent place in his culture. And here, I appeal to the Indian's supreme power in my attempt to heal the chief's son. Well, we've heard from our scout, our trader, and our medicine man. 
Now it's time for the white medicine man's story. That's Doc Grayson, the part I play in the picture. You know, Iron Eyes, the truth of the matter is, a frontier doctor didn't have too much more to work with than you did. A little calomel, a dash of spirits of lavender to make stuff taste good, and that was about the extent of his medicine. Oh, a doctor had his problems, all right. Most of them, the kind he'd never find in the medical books. As Doc Grayson and Westward Ho, I was faced with a unique decision. Here's how it came about. Well, the old man made his talk to the buffalo, and it ain't done no good. You go near that boy now, and they'll kill you. Too late, I tell you. Maybe. But I've got to try. Well, then, as now, a doctor's code made him go wherever he thought he was needed. Neewatha. Neowisha. But here's what we were walking into. Our party has had a falling out with the Sioux chief, Wolf's brother. And to make matters worse, the chief's son is near death. As a doctor, I have a pretty good idea as to what his injury is. And so I feel I should try to help the boy. But the problem is this, how to overcome the professional rivalry and resentment of the Indian medicine man. Nahon washishun. Prayers of many stars, good. Great spirit, hear. Your medicine bring white doctor. Many stars have big magic. Now use magic. Well, if I can help the boy, the old man can claim the credit. You ought to see that. <laughs> now don't worry. You ain't missing no bets. Not that old now. Right now, he's figured out who he'll blame if the boy dies after you work on him. You think of that. Well, it was a touchy situation, and I didn't know just what I was getting into. I couldn't be sure I knew what the trouble was, and I couldn't really guarantee any cure. But whatever happened, the results, good or bad, were sure to be charged up to me. This is a trouble. It's a broken clavicle. A bone splinters punctured a vein in the neck. Internal bleeding and swelling are interfering with his breathing. I'll try to relieve the pressure. Perhaps the biggest problem was the fact that there was no way to tell the boy's father what I proposed to do. When I got out my scalpel, it looked like the whole thing was off. Here I go. And so it went. One crisis after another. That was the whole story of the Oregon Trail. There's a Pawnee war camp nearby. They may attack. Our best bet's to get up into the notch yonder before daylight. When an Indian attack was coming, it didn't matter what your title was, doctor, farmer, mule skinner, everybody was in the same boat. And a doctor pitched in and fought the good fight with the rest. Got our packs made up, Doc. Good. Send any extra men and guns to the end of the train. 
I'm gonna rig a couple of wagons as sort of a rear guard. This time we couldn't turn if we had three times as many guns. It looked bad, all right. But one of the tests of the trail was thinking your way out of tight places. Sometimes you came out on top, and sometimes you didn't. It was the chance you took, because the whole adventure from start to finish was a gamble. Frontiersmen, Indians, traders, and doctors, and plain everyday people. All were part of the Oregon Trail story. Yet of all these, it was the plodding wagon people who put a permanent mark upon the land. Pioneers all. They were the ones who settled the land and built the roads and put up the cabins and made the homes of a future nation. Westward go, the wagons always westward go. Westward go, the wagons, for our eight guns are known. There's magic in the wind. In the sky, there's a promised land awaiting, and we'll get there by and by. Westward roll the wagons, westward roll and far. Westward roll the wagons toward the western star. Westward roll, westward roll, westward Next week, our program will come to you from Fantasyland. We'll take you directly to Donald Duck's home, where you will see how he spends an average day with his three nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Here now are a few highlights from that show. Next week, Walt Disney invites you to spend a day at home with Donald Duck. It's a very special day, too. It's Donald's birthday, and although Donald has forgotten all about it, his three little nephews, Huey, Louie and Dewey have remembered the day, and they want to buy Uncle Donald a present. Conscience clears up the misunderstanding and suggests how he can make amends. Pal, look, now what you gotta do is to build yourself back up in the eyes of those kids. And a way to do that, be humble. Give in a little. I got it. Give him a party. So Donald stages his own birthday party, and all his pals join the celebration. Goofy cut short a duck hunting trip to be there. Pluto, who fancies...
fancies himself as a musician, rehearses a song for the party. <laughs> But it's Mickey, Donald's best and oldest friend, who really makes the party a success. From his famous Mickey Mouse Club, he brings along the Mouseketeers. And the world-famous jazz combo, the Firehouse Five Plus Two, to make Donald's birthday a rollicking success. So be with us next week to help Mickey, Goofy, Pluto, and all the gang celebrate Donald's birthday when Walt Disney brings you At Home with Donald Duck. Soon, in motion picture theaters everywhere, you'll be able to see for the first time Walt Disney's new Technicolor feature, Westward Ho! The Wagons. It's a new and different outdoor drama, telling the exciting story of the covered wagon families fighting their way west, told against a background of spectacular scenic beauty in Cinemascope and Technicolor. Westward Ho! The Wagons, starring Fess Parker, Jeff York, Kathleen Crowley, soon in motion picture theaters everywhere. This has been an ABC Television Network film presentation.